Okay, part six, African origins of pharaonic art and architecture. We're moving right along. Uh, we're at the temple of Koambo. And you remember I talked uh, before about the, the temples being up on a hill so you could see by the steps uh, visitors would come uh, to visit the temple. It's a double temple, the temple of uh, Horaeus and Sobek, um, which in fact is uh, 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 Heru and Sobek. Horaeus is the, the Greek pronunciation. Uh, so we're standing right outside the double temple. On one side of the temple, you have Sebek, and on the other side, you have Heru. And these two temples have everything identical going all the way back to the Holy of Holies. Uh, so it's uh, one of uh, the uh, temples that I know of that has uh, a dedication to two gods uh, with their Holy of Holies built in close proximity. Now, this is the place where uh, the, when we look at, well, let's go back here again. When we look at above the, uh, in the architrave, up at top, we see the flying disc of Heru of Bedetti. Now, Bedetti uh, was a, we'll get more into the story here. Um, Bedetti was a warrior god for the god Ra. Uh, the story goes that the god uh, Ra was getting old and that there were rebellions all over Kemet and Nubia and especially in Kemet. Um, so he wanted Heru to go and destroy the enemies. Now with the help of uh, Jehudi or Thoth and his magical formula, he was able to provide Heru with the protection of the two goddesses, Nekbet and Wajet, goddess of the north and goddess of the south, as the eye of Heru, which is the protection. And so that's why we have the winged solar disc, because it would fly over its enemies, and Heru would fly so high in the sky that he would actually blind his enemies and dis orient them and they would start to kill one another. So this is why we have this on the, uh, the uh, architrave of most of the temples you visit. Now the Temple of Coombo, I uh, put this floor plan in here quick so that we could, you know, get an idea of, uh, you know, the two entrances. We go into the peristyle court, then we go into a hyperstyle court which they call the vestibule, the hyperstyle uh, hall, uh, and the antechambers, they're all exactly the same. You got A and B for the two uh, holy of holies. And um, everything that you see on one side is actually on the other side, but they're dedicated to two different gods. This is another view of the temple of Koambo. Now there's some interesting things about this uh, that I like to point out because I found a, a little, uh, did, did a little research and I found out that, that uh, the, uh, initially, uh, with the exception of a doorway of sandstone built into a wall of brick, this was part of a temple built by Thutmosis III in honor of the crocodile-headed god Sebek. The monarch is represented on tress, the door jams, holding the measuring reed and chisel. 
the emblems of construction and in the act of dedicating the temple. So now what you got here is the, uh, the, the historical perspective that says that this was a, a Greek built temple by the Ptolemies. Mm -hmm. But no mention at all about the, uh, the, the, the African presence. Now, you know, when the Ptolemies came in, you're talking 332 uh, BC. Now, when you're talking about uh, Thutmosis, you're talking about 1500 BC. So the temple obviously was here before the Greeks and the Romans came in. But we got this idea through everything that you read. It tells you that this is a, a, a temple built by uh, uh, Ptolemy the the sixth, Ptolemy the seventh, and then you read about the temples who were supposedly had been built by the uh, Romans, and we know for a fact that at most what they did was they they first of all they constructed buildings in the temple complex already in the sacred spots that have already been sacred for thousands of years before they even came there. They had to submit to the idea and the fact that the architecture and the art was so overwhelming, they had nothing to bring to it other than to enhance it and to show their appreciation because they came into a land where they could not dominate, uh, you know, the, uh, from a, from, from a uh, ideology point of view. They couldn't dominate the spiritual aspect. They couldn't dominate the the uh, the gods. Uh, so what they did was they copied all the gods, and we know that. I mean, you know. Uh, so, but they showed their appreciation by representing themselves as making gifts and offerings to the various deities that had existed thousands of years before they came. Mm -hmm. Well, the question that I wanted to ask you is that: Did the Greeks themselves actually? do carving and construction or uh, did the Africans who were there? There's no the doubt that the Africans who were there were the ones who knew how to do the carving, who knew how to set up those columns, who knew how to set up those lentils, who knew how to put the, 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 the building together, the stonemasons, all of that. That was African. Yeah, because I wanted to ask you, is there any structures in Egypt, that re in, in uh, Greece, or Rome, BC, that would reflect their knowledge uh, of, and, and their ability to do this kind of construction? Uh, not that I know of, because look, I, we went through, uh, I, I believe it was uh, uh, lecture three and four, where we showed the, the parallel between the temple of Heshepsut with the fluted columns and the Doric, uh, the, uh, the, the so-called Greek Doric uh, capitals. And we compared that with the Temple of Athena, which is their greatest monument. Mm -hmm. uh, and when was that built? That was built around about 400 some odd uh, 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 AD. Mm -hmm. Athena. Athena. That's a war monument. That's a monument to the goddess Athena. Okay. The goddess Athena, who was a form of the goddess Neith mm -hmm. from uh, Egypt. Mm -hmm. the, this goddess, when you, when you went into the temple of Athena, what you would see is the goddess with a shield and bow. She was a war goddess. The Greeks really loved and appreciated the, the goddesses uh, of uh, ancient uh, Kemet as being the patron goddess, in other words, the, the patron of the of, of the the, the uh, of war, and we had quite a few of those right there in Kemet. So everything being the same, the avatars and the expression of the idea was uh, transferred to Greece, uh, and I showed that there was like a about fifteen hundred year difference between the temple of uh, Queen Hatshepsut 
and the uh, Parthenon. The Parthenon was built when? Because isn't the Parthenon considered the first Greek structure? Uh, stone, stone temple. Yes, the Parthenon, and this, which was built in Athens, and also known as the as the Temple of Athena. Yeah, when? Oh, oh, that was built in A.D. about 500 A.D. It's around about 400 A.D. Around about 400 A.D. Mm -hmm. If I'm if uh, if I'm correct, but hey, you know, uh, let me see, 47. I'd have to go back over my notes to, you know, okay. but that was that was something that was just, you know, because by that time also you had the Roman, the Romans in Kem, uh, Kemet. So I could be off with that in terms of the exact date, but in my previous lecture, um, I did give the exact dates. Mm -hmm. All right, so we have both deities together. We have uh, Heru, and we have the god Sebek, uh, holding the Was scepter, the scepter of power. Now, this piece is showing Sebek on your right-hand side and Heru on the other side, being protected by the god Ra. Mm -hmm. And that's how we make the distinction between Heru and Ra, because of the solar disk with the cobra in the front. And so that means that all these deities right here have, in other words, this is Ra Horakti, and this is Ra Sebek. Okay, here we have the uh, the Pharaoh and the Queen uh, passing on the Sekum, symbol of power, in his right hand. And in his left hand, he has the tools for, uh, for the uh, uh, layout of the temple. Uh, the tools that are, that are uh, uh, used to, uh, that an engineer would use to lay out the temple. And he's passing on the power to uh, Heru along with the uh, uh, goddess Hathor. We're on the side of Koumbo, the double temple, which is representing Heru now, because we have images on both sides. And you can see, all right, here, um, we, we, we're back on the side of Sebek, and if you notice, which is pretty interesting, the crown that Sebek is wearing, he's wearing the tall feathers of the oyster, the oyster's feather of Amun. He has the horns of Kanun, the creator god from the south, with the solar disk. He has the two eyes of Ra, which are symbolically interpreted as the cobras, one of the south and one of the north, Nekbet and Wajet. And on close examination, you can look at this crown and you can actually see the small horns outlined here the gazelle horns that actually the goddess Setet from Elephantine. And we looked at her 
her temple before she had about five or six layers of temples going down that you could actually go in today and, and go down into those, uh, those temples that were buried underneath uh, the ground. But Satet, that's her, that's her, uh, her uh, uh, symbol right there. Uh, of the gazelle, so you got a this. Uh, uh, this is a unique crown in in terms of the composite elements, showing that this is Ra Sebek. This is the sun god. It's Heru again, wearing the crown of up in Lower Egypt, the red and white crown. In this scene, we have the uh, coronation. Uh, the coronation of the Pharaoh here is being taken is is taking place as Sebek looks on. Uh, here you have uh, Nekbet in the form of a woman instead of the uh, cobra or vulture and you have on the other side uh, even though it's all uh, this is that block has been removed uh, you have Wajet of the north so you have the north and the south and we can tell by the crown she's wearing the white crown and if this piece was in you would see her wearing the red crown symbols of upper and lower Egypt This is a better view of it. Wajet with the red crown. Nekbet with the white crown. Crowning the Pharaoh with both crowns, white and red crown. As Ra Hurati looks on. Uh, in this scene, this must be the season of Shamu. The season of Shamu is the planting season. And here you see the Pharaoh is throwing the seeds in the ceremony. And down at the bottom here is the symbol of the plot of uh, land that would be fertilized. This is one panel. And it's showing Raharakti and uh, the, god, the goddess Hathor looking on in the ceremony. This is the goddess Hetheru again, one of the columns. The god Heru. Here you have again both the goddess Wechek and wearing the white crown, the goddess Nekbet in their cobra forms. Uh, the vulture goddess who could be called Mut is actually by the crown, you can see that she is the, the uh, goddess of the north, wearing the red crown. This is uh, Wedjet. And you have the Sphinx of Heru beside her. And this is a rare image, the image of uh, Heru, the falcon-headed god with the body of a lion, with the protection of the sun god, Ra behind him. These are some glyphs that actually show a list of offerings that were made at the temple. Uh, they, all, they all start off with geese at the top. And then they, they show other uh, sacri uh, sacrifices like fish and what have you. So this is a 
a, a list of the, the kinds of things that were, were being offered. Uh, his uh, wine on a rack. Uh, these are some more glyphs of what they call the uh, uh, low relief cut into the stone and done in such a way that it actually gives volume to the figures. They call this a low relief. High relief is when the image is cut and protrudes from the surface. Here we see the, the image cut, but actually cut into the surface and to give it volume you know this is in, in, in incredible the the kind of uh, sculpture uh, uh, and relief that was uh, done most of these temples paid a lot of attention this is the bitty from the not soup bitty B the B of the south uh, this is a goddess uh, who is a goddess of uh, the trees. Nobody really knows her name, but a symbol at the top shows you that she has the seeds and she's bringing uh, three trees. And because this temple was uh, uh, basically uh, dedicated Sebek uh, by Thutmosis III, Thutmosis III being the nephew of Heshepsut, at the time, she made her tour to uh, Samaya, uh, to Pont, to pick up these uh, uh, trees and perfume and uh, different types of, uh, of uh, animals and, uh, and uh, uh, koi koi uh, that she had brought back with her. This was pretty much around the same time. I want to point out, if I may, and I want you to comment on it mm -hmm. in regard to the other gods as well. You can actually see the Papacorn hair. You can see the African hair. And, to, you know, we used mm -hmm. to think that Af uh, African people didn't have long hair. Yeah. But when you look at us today, uh, where people are letting their hair grow uh, into locks, it goes mm -hmm. all the way down to their butt. Yeah, yeah, Some sure. go down to their knees. Yeah. And this is the same hair. I mean, it's obvious that these gods were... African people. Oh yeah, there's no question about it, especially when you visit the uh, Egyptian Museum. Mm -hmm. uh, the Egyptian Museum in Cairo, you can see it uh, very clearly because they have wigs and uh, what have you of African hair, uh, you know, in, the, in, in their exhibit cases. And uh, there's no question about it that these were all African. This the whole idea is, all of the ideas and concepts that goes into the art and the architecture is African. There's no question about it. But they so much, but the Europeans, they're, they're so meticulous in trying to cover every little aspect that might reveal the Africanness and, and the, 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 the origin of the culture. They're always trying to put it on somebody else. Oh, these people came in from uh, Asia, and they were the ones that developed the culture. But, I mean, realistically speaking, when you come into Egypt, you're coming into the, the end part, the end part of the Nile Valley civilization. Because basically what you're going to see up in Heliopolis, or, or what they call Heliopolis in those days, or today known as Cairo, what you're going to see is basically the three great pyramids. Uh, you go a few miles down the Nile, and then you go into uh, Saqqara, where you can see the step pyramid. And then you have the other pyramids uh, that, uh, uh, you know, from the fifth dynasty and the sixth dynasty. But that's it. If you want action, you got to go where the action took place. You got to go to Karnak Temple. You got to visit the Valley of the Kings, the Valley of the Queens. All this is in Nubia. Let's, you know, I mean, when I took my first trip in 1987, I, I said to myself, I said, well, you know, this is all Egypt, but it wasn't. In my mind, it was. But then I, when I started to realize that, you know, the, that all of the 
the, the temples, uh, the major temples, the temple of Isis, the temple of, uh, of uh, Hethor, uh, uh, Hetheru, in, uh, in uh, 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 the temple of Hethor in Dendera, uh, the temple of uh, uh, Heshepsut, the, the temple of Ramses III, the temple of Luxor Temple, the temple of Karnak. All of these great temples, the temple of uh, Amen, Amenhotep III, all of these great temples with the, temple, with the, uh, the colossals of uh, Memnon in front of uh, the, the huge temple of uh, Ramses, the, uh, I mean, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Amenhotep III, all of that's in Nubia. All of that's in Nubia. And there's nothing but black folks that live around there, except for the ones who had uh, uh, intermarried, came down there, and, start, and started to live down there. But the majority of the population, which they keep in the background somehow in the villages, but most of them come out and they work and they maintain the monuments. They take care of the monuments. They, they're the ones who, 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 uh, who, who help uh, do the guides, they do they, the Faluka boats. You know, it's all run by Nubia. To get from one island to the next island, you take a Faluka boat, and that's Nubia. All this, this, this is Nubia. This is not the, the North Egypt. And the different forms of uh, the different forms of, of the two goddesses. This is uh, Wetjet, and this is uh, this is Nekbet. I'm sorry, and this is Wajet. This is Sebek again. This is Sebek Ra. Got a totally different crowd, huh? Mm. Of course, we're on the side of uh, 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 Sebek because this is where all the tributes are being, be it the tributes and offerings are being made to uh, 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 Sebek and, uh, and, and Horus. You see, we have an offering table here, and both of these deities are at the offering table. We also have the goddess Heth, uh, Het Heru in attendance. Here we have the, uh, the pharaoh hailing Sebek. Now, we have the three uh, goddesses, and they all look the same. Could this be an a example of the avatar in the three different forms? Well, it is. If you look at the goddess, Tefnut, the brother of Shu. She is a lion-headed goddess. If you look at the goddess, the next one, the goddess Sekhmet, which is also a lion-headed goddess. Then you have the third lion-headed goddess. The third lion-headed goddess is Menhit. That's M E E N H I T, the war goddess. She's the patron of the Egyptian army. She's the one that's in the front of the army. She's the one that defeats the enemies of the Pharaoh and Kemet. Her husband, her consort was Amhar. Uh, 
Ann Hoare, A-N-H-O-R, Greek name, Ann Hoare, or Ann Heru, uh, was also a military god, patron of the military. All right, again, we have both uh, Heru and Sebek. As we look at these fragments of the temple, now we come to uh, this part of the temple, which is the part that actually shows the calendar, the lunar calendar. And you can see by this very dark spot right here, it's where most of the guides go up and they start pointing. Uh, now, what year was that calendar created? This is a lunar calendar, so of course, <coughs> It, 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 of course, it's prior to the solar calendar. You had the stellar calendar first, which was the calendar that showed the group of stars that would come across the horizon, that were named, identified, and those, that group, or what they call a constellation, every time that constellation came back around at 360 degrees, they knew exactly what time of the year it was until they had to get the five economical days that uh, Thoth had, had, had put in there to make it 365 days in a cycle. So you had the stellar calendar first and the early, the, uh, early deities of ancient Kemet, instead of having solar discs on their head, they had, they had stars on their head in the imagery. And then later on, you had the solar gods, Kansu and the rest of them that would wear the crescent on top of their heads. So uh, the, what's being shown here in the temple right now is the, the calendar for the lunar. It's the lunar calendar. We'll get a little closer uh, up on it. As I pointed out before, you know, you got your dark spots here where most of the, the, uh, the uh, uh, tour guides, they would come and they would start here at the month of Shemu. This is the image that we're looking at here is an image of a plot of ground with uh, reeds growing on it. <clears throat> but if we start a little further up, you know that these little characters that represent, that look like horseshoes, stand for the number 10. And so if we pay attention here, we have, uh, we have uh, 10 and 10 is 20. And then you got 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. So this is the 26th day of the month, 27, 28, now you got 29, 30, because you only have 30 days in the month uh, in the uh, old Kemet uh, calendar. And then it starts the new uh, season that you can see right here, starting with the season of Shamu. First full moon, the second day, one and two, third, three, four, five, when we count the little sticks, six. So we get a sense of the day uh, based on the calendar. Like most temples, you have a uh, you have a uh, uh, you have images showing the captives, and uh, here we have some captives. And when the f when you first look at them, you think they would have cartouches, but these are not cartouches. These are actually uh, shields. And the captives, you could tell that they have their arms tied behind their backs. So these are. You know, and then I, when, every time I look at this one here, I see the one, two, three bows, you know, uh, the symbol of the, this one right here. Uh, because the, the bows, you would find uh, down at the feet, Ramses II, down at the feet of uh, even much earlier, uh, of uh, Khufu, uh, uh, 
they were known as the nine bows, but the, the bows actually represented the, the, the north, the, the people of the north. Enemies. Uh, the uh, northern uh, uh, African area, uh, uh, North Africa, that area, and uh, the, the sea people, the Mediterranean. These were, the, the, those were known as the land of the bows up there. It's different from the land of, of the bow in uh, uh, Tanahisi. Uh -huh. So these were European invaders. Uh, no, they were, they were, some of them were African, African from Libya. Uh, oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, they, they, they would, uh, you know, they would come down and try to take over. And sometimes they would be in confederation with uh, uh, some of the Europeans, so-called Europeans, that came from out of the Levant, of what we call Israel and, and uh, Syria. Uh, they would have confederations. All right, so this is another view of uh, the God Happy. Let me ask you, while we are <clears throat> talking about armies, uh, I know some of the historians said that Egypt didn't have a standing army. That's not they true. They didn't need a standing army. That's not true. <laughs> I don't know who said that, but I, I can say this much. Every pharaoh that came to the throne that we know of, even Thutmose III, as young as he was, he was around about 18, 19 years old. Uh, Thutmose III went all the way up into uh, 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 Syria to, to get the people back in line. And he won. This was known as the uh, Battle of Megiddo. The Battle of Megiddo, the Great Battle of Megiddo. Every one of the pharaohs, Hesheb-Sud had to keep fighting the so-called Hyksoks after her father, Achmas, the first, started the 18th dynasty and ran them out. Amenahet of the 12th dynasty and Sarsostris, all of them was fighting. They, 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 the, only, the only pharaoh that refused to protect the border and refused to uh, and refused to honor was Akhenaten. Yeah, right. It was Akhenaten. Uh and refused to honor the the uh, the treaties it was Akhenaten. They called for help for Akhenaten to come and help them. He wouldn't do it. Uh, he was too consumed with the new religion. Uh, that the Europeans call monotheism, and um, you know it wouldn't have been so bad if not would have just left the temples alone. He put a whole bunch of priests out of work. Mm -hmm. He shut down all those temples, the temples of Karnak, the, all of the temples, the great temples, the temple of Dendera. He shut them all down for the one God. The Aten. He probably would have been better off if he would have left them. You see, because he wasn't really teaching anything much different than what they was teaching. But you see, the idea is that when you study uh, the, uh, the, the the old religion, the the religion of the, of Amun Ra, compared to Aten, it's still the same thing. They just have more representation, more avatars, more, more uh, 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 transformations taking place between the deities and so forth and so on. Ignatius said, no, we just, we just want to have this one standing image. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that made the, 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 the difference in terms of what the European his, uh, historians and uh, Egyptologists say is that he was for monotheism. The, the rest of it was polytheists. And so we know that behind that, the, the, the whole concept of polytheism, in fact, was the elements of nature that we had dealt with, wherein, and not put all of his uh, theosophy and theology into the sun. Mm. 
because we were still worshiping the air, the water, the, uh, everything was everything. Everything was everything. All right, you got the, uh, uh, we had pointed out before, you got your Ankh and, and you got your Was Scepter. Was Scepter standing for power, life, and the bowl, uh, which stands for all. And the hieroglyphs. Now this is interesting because you don't really see this much, this particular image, but this is one of the images from uh, the temple of uh, Ko Ambo. And notice the Was Scepter. The Was Scepter is the image of who? Set. Hmm. This is Set. Don't forget now, all of Nubia was, uh, the god Set was the prime deity. That's why you got Was Set. The, the, the holiest of uh, places with a thousand gates, talking about Karnak Temple, had Waset. You had the, uh, you still had the, 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 the pharaohs who had the name Set in it. Seti, Seti one, Seti two. Uh, then you have the uh, Temple of Set, which I showed earlier in some of the early, uh, uh, I think it was in uh, the, the third lesson where we visited the Temple of Set. So it no longer exists, but we saw the reconstruction of it. I brought the reconstruction in. So this was the land of Set. And those symbols right there represent Set. I, and I think I showed uh, uh, where Set was a benevolent god protecting the uh, boat of Ra as he travels through the night before he became a uh, yeah before he became the uh, Set the terrible. <laughs> Uh, we, we saw earlier the, the, uh, the ceremony where the pharaoh was throwing the seeds. And then when we move to the next panel, we see the pharaoh again in a procession behind uh, Het Heru and Sebek, holding the Was Scepter. All right, uh, basically what you're looking at here are keys. These are keys where they used to actually take uh, pieces of wood, put it down between the stones like this. They would wet it so that it would expand, the wood would expand. And this would be uh, a preventive measurement, uh, measure for Earthquakes, in other words, the stones wouldn't topple because they would be secured by these keys, what they call the keys. And uh, as you look around the perimeter of the, uh, the court, the outer court, you can see these keys to hold these uh, stone walls. These walls were, were higher, much higher than they are now. Some of them had beautiful imagery on it, and of course they uh, dismantled these walls and took them to different parts of the world so that they could be in the museums and so forth and so on. And we're looking at this temple from uh, the uh, from 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 the west, looking out towards the Nile River here. This is part of the temple complex. A lot of uh, ruin. And of course, this is the famous wall that shows uh, medical the medical instruments, instruments for performing surgery, including scalpels, curettes, forceps, dilators, 
scissors, and medicine bottles. Can I point that out? Can you see the uh, you have a close up of that? Yeah, I showed this in, in uh Yeah, no. In lecture four when I actually had a comparison with the actual tools themselves. Right, right. Okay, we got it. We got it. Yeah, yeah. I just I show I, yeah I went I, I dug up the I dug I see the birthing chair that you didn't go over that before. No, uh, no, no, I went over the birthing chair. Not the birthing chair. This is the birthing chair right here. This is uh, the goddess I see sitting on the birthing uh, chair, right yeah. here. Right. Uh, one of the things they did point out though is that they they also have a scale. Uh, let's see if I can see it here. No, it's, it's difficult because it's too small for me to see everything here. Uh, anyway, the, the, the god uh, Imhotep is looking on. They have their sterilization bowl here to sterilize the uh, instruments uh, with hot water. Here the Pharaoh is... Now, what, 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 what period is this temple where this is going on? Uh, what you mean by what period? Uh, what year? Oh, that, that's a good question. I mean, because look, the temple is always being rebuilt. Uh, the temple is always being, uh, is, is always evolving. Now, if you want to know when this was... Now, the, the, uh, what they would tell you is that this is uh, Ptolemy the sixth through the ninth had contributed to this temple. But as I pointed out before, we can go back to the 18th dynasty to Thutmosis the third. Because on the door jam, it shows him dedicating the temple to, uh, and I'm sorry I don't have a photo of that, mm -hmm. to uh, God's back. Mm -hmm. So by the time the Greeks got there in 332, the temple was already, let me see, 1500, around about uh, 1500 B.C. because that was around the time of Heshep Sud and Thutmosis. So it was 1200 years. Yeah, it was, yeah, it was, it was old and probably older than that before uh, Thutmosis III came in. But that was a good question though. Uh, here the Pharaoh is, uh, he's putting incense into the incense container and he's offering it to the god Horakti, Ra Horakti. Okay, uh, you have uh, Ra Horakti here, and then when we go to this panel, we see the, the brother and sister, the god Shu, with his tall feather. You know, because some people look at this right away and they say, oh no, that's, uh, that, that, that's, uh, uh, that's my act with the feather. Mm -hmm. But this is the male deity. And we talked about the lion goddess, mm -hmm. Tefnut, uh, being his sister. So you have Shu and Tefnut. As a matter of fact, that's my email address, shutefnut at mac.com. Mm -hmm. Okay, now this is, this is now you, you were talking about the 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 idea of uh, uh, of uh, these later theologians who had come into uh, Kemet and uh, uh, Nubia, and on this wall here, we were supposed to have the four saints: mm -hmm. Matthew, Luke, John, and who else? Matthew, Luke, John, and Mark. Mark. So we're going to take a, a close-up look at this. How do you equate them? Well, I'm going to show you right now. Uh, you have... You have a uh, mark in the shape of a lion. He was, his symbol was the lion. Then you had the eagle 
which was John. Then you had uh, the bull, which was Luke. Who is the bull? Right here. Uh -huh. And then below, you had the image of, uh, of, of God. That's, that's totally destroyed now. Let me see if we got a closer. Okay. You have Matthew. That part of the wall is totally destroyed. Then you have the lion, which is Mark. Then you have uh, the bull, which is Luke. And then you have the eagle, which is John. Mm -hmm. So that's where the concept came from. Well, what's the parallel? Well, the parallel is that these are the four Christian saints, uh, major saints. Mm -hmm. Mark, Luke, John, and Matthew. But how do you connect them outside of the imagery? There's no writing. There's nothing that connects them. But that's a good question. That's a real good question. But I mean, from what I've read and from what I've understood, that this was the representation for those symbols. Now, whether the uh, the Christian theologians uh, looked at it in that regard as you know, this is the direct connection between um, between what I'm seeing here on the temple wall and what I'm going to write into the books. Uh, you know, for these. Uh, I think a lot of it has to do, too, with the priests of the temples. You know, they wrote down a lot of stuff. And I think the way it was interpreted might have made it a connection between those saints. Those saints and uh, the images that we saw on the temple wall. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, I mean, the only way you're going to understand anything really about Egypt is you got to look at stuff through the eyes of... You have to have symbolist eyes, as, as they say. You have to have symbolist eyes. You can't actually go by literal uh, literacy, literal uh, interpretations all the time. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. but that's a that's an excellent question. I'm gonna see if I can uh, uh, go a little deeper with that. Okay, we're uh, we're we're at the uh, nilometer here. Of course, every, this is every a. Every time I think about that nilometer. Mm -hmm. I think, God, that I'm here. I had my great big camera, and I wanted to go down and now I meet. I don't know why. I just wanted to run down there and get a good shot. And you know those steps are so old and they're so worn mm -hmm. that I went all the way down in that now meter to the water, and I have no idea how deep it was. Mm -hmm. uh, I realized once I got back up and looked back. It would have been very easy for me to slip and with that big camera on my shoulder. Mm. There was no way <laughs> that I could have uh, mm. either got back with the camera. If I got back with myself, I'd have mm -hmm. been fine. But I don't know how deep the water was. I don't know what was going and on. And you went down in. You, you, you went, went all the way down. You went all the way down. Yeah. Yeah. Now, was it this one uh, at uh, uh, the Temple of Coombo? Or... Uh, was it one of the uh, one of the other ones? All right. This looks just like a thing. This is a, uh, another view of the nilometer looking down, and yeah, of course, it, it was a long way down. Uh, yeah, know. yeah. Well, um, but uh, uh, you know, I mean, the the nilometer, uh, the the nilometer was just uh, basically used to measure the silt. And uh, the rising of the Nile to... How does the water come into it? Is that connected to the Nile? The, yeah, subter the yeah, subterranean. They, you know, they built a... Uh, so so oh. that, yeah, subterranean, the water would come in underneath uh, the architecture itself. Okay. It, it's the same way they built the uh, uh, caverns and whatnot. Like at uh, Saqqara, they built these uh, Saqqara, uh, these uh, caverns underneath Saqqara, where the apis bull was be was buried. A lot of people don't get a chance to see that. You don't get nobody gets a really a chance to go and see see that. I don't know if they don't open it up or or what. But they had these big, huge stone sarcophagus with the with the apis bull buried inside them, 
down in these huge chambers underground, near, near the, the uh, uh, Step Pyramid. The bulls were real? I mean, of were, course. They were, they were sacred bulls. They were sacred bulls. And when they died, they were uh, mummified. The sacred bull, yeah. That's where the Greeks and the uh, uh, the uh, and the uh, what do you call the uh, in the Mediterranean they were, they were the worship of the bull was uh, the island of Crete, mm -hmm. the Minoans, mm -hmm. the Minoans in the, in, the, in the sacred bull, and the stories that came out of that that came right here from Kemet. Mm -hmm. You know, they. Just like you would find mummified crocodiles at the temple of Sebek, you would find mummified bulls. And of course, those bulls had to be, there was a special type of book that had a bull that had a special marking on him that they identified and made that bull sacred. And it's interesting too because they did the same thing with lions. Uh, they, there was a temple built to, uh, the goddess, uh, uh, the goddess, uh, segment, lion goddess, and they had lions, they were all lions, and so when they, they buried them, they buried them, they mummified them. You, know, you find that all over Egypt, it, you know, I mean, different places, they even had mummified uh, 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 animals such as cats. Now, at the temple of Coombo, um, there is a chapel, the chapel of Sebek where you would actually find a mummified, right there, mummified crocodiles. This is Sebek. Now, these were the mummified uh, crocodiles. This is out in a small court uh, from, the, uh, from the chapel of uh, Sebek. This is outside in the courtyard. And these sarcophagi are in the shape of uh, cartouches. Mm -hmm. You can see they're in the shape of the cartouche. And these are uh, rough hewn, as you can see. Uh, some of them even still have the color in the decoration, even though the lid might be broken. But that's an interesting sideline uh, to visiting the Temple of Coombo. Now you got here is the uh, here is the the uh, the chapel of Sebek. It's right there at uh, at the Temple of Coombo proper. Uh, these are some of the mummified crocodiles from the temple that's in the chapel. This is a view uh, looking south from the uh, front of the chapel. It's another view on the right hand side looking at the uh, looking at that portion of the temple which actually belongs to Sebek, the god Sebek. We have a coronation scene in this panel uh, with uh, uh, Heru and uh, Jehudi uh, 
throwing uh, the, the, the holy uh, water or the baptismal scene. Let's see if we got a better picture of that. Here we go. Uh, this is a coronation scene or baptismal scene showing the uh, god Heru and, uh, and uh, Jehudi or Thoth pouring the holy water over the pharaoh in the form of onks and wasceptors. Onks and wasceptors, they alternate these images uh, that's supposed to represent, you know, the cleansing of the pharaoh mm -hmm. before coronation. Uh, we got basically the, 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 the uh, this scene right here shows uh, the attendance of the different gods uh, to the Pharaoh. You have Jehuti, you have uh, Hedheru, the Pharaoh, the goddess Menhet, goddess of war, Heru, the elder, and Heru the younger. Horus the elder and Horus the younger. to show some of the color uh, you can see the colors they still have the beautiful colors the red and the blues and whatnot that's in there uh, you know but most of it is fading away this is the god this is the this is the the, the, the pharaoh with the crown of four large feathers. It's very rare you see this crown, but this is the crown of the god Anhor. We spoke about him earlier. Anhor is the god of war and the patron, the patron, uh, the patron god of uh, the armies of Kemet. Now, what do you think that Ramses is the second and uh, the, the whole, uh, the thing with Ramses uh, at uh, Kadesh, the Battle of uh, Kadesh, which is uh, immortalized in the temple at Abu Simbel, showing how he. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, all right. So, uh, it, so yes. You're talking about the Battle of Kadesh. Yeah, the, the Battle of Kadesh. And also that uh, uh, Anhor is wearing. The tall feathers, the four tall feathers, mm -hmm. ordinarily it would be two if it was Amun. Uh, but we have four tall feathers here, and that represents the patron saint of the army, uh, of the military, the military arm of Egypt. Now, some people say Egypt never had a standing military, but that's really hard to believe especially when you go to these various temples where the pharaohs had actually memorialized in stone the conquest of foreigners, whether those foreigners be in the north or whether those uh, enemies be from the south, enemies to the throne. So this is Anhor, the consul of Menhet. Let's go to the next one. Again, uh, this, these images, they reappear in mostly all of the temples throughout Kemet and Nubia, or Egypt and Nubia, which of course we're in Nubia now, showing the Ankh and the Was scepter, all powerful all life and power. You have the beautiful palm capitals here. And the, the imagery is uh, standard pretty much throughout mostly all of the temples.
Now what you have here at the base of this column is in most temples throughout ancient Kemet and Tanahisi, Nubia. This is called the recti bird or lap wing. These birds travel all the way from Greenland all the way down to South Africa in one direction, north, south. And then they travel just as wide going from east to west. You said from Greenland? Yeah. These birds, they travel. Yes, sir. And, and they're called the they're, they're called the lap wing. When you get a chance, go to your computer, check out the lap wing, see the distance that they migrate. Um, so you got the lap wing here, and uh, he's standing on the uh, the neb. Uh, you know, we talked about that basket before, and he has arms praisey, and there's a star. The lap wing represents the people. Now don't forget, mostly all of the temples have this imagery, iconography at the base of the columns. Mm -hmm. Yes, at the base of the columns. So you got the symbol for all. The basket down here, the symbol for all. The people give praises. All the people give praises. So that's what this symbol represents. Okay, uh, in this picture right here, we're looking down on uh, the, the right-hand side of the temple. And uh, I think we're going to look through a few of the chambers. I think I have some pictures of uh, being able to look. All right, so we're starting to look down through these different doorways, through these, uh, uh, the, in each uh, one of the chambers, you can see a hyperstyle hall that's pretty close by with the two columns. And I think you got about four chambers that go uh, directly to the back where the Holy of Holies is. Uh, so if I count the, uh, the uh, lentils where uh, uh, Heru Vedetti, the uh, solar disc, the flying solar disc, you got one, two, three, right. You got about four uh, areas that you can go back through or chambers uh, including the Hypestyle Hall, to get to the Holy of Holies. And that's one side. Uh, this image I think we've seen before. Mm -hmm. This is uh, Sebek in his crocodile form. Uh, this is uh, Ra Sebek with the solar disc on his head. with a uh, offering table in front of him, with uh, some uh, lotus plants and, and uh, some breads, different types of sweet breads. We got the symbol for all, the uh, neb down at the bottom. Now, what's interesting is that this uh, image right here, uh, which is a, a, a very different image because it has the, the, the ankh uh, symbols on the arm and then holding two staffs. And actually what these staffs are, I'm still trying to research it to find it out. But uh, as a, as a, as a uh, conservative image, you, you have the solar disk with the uh, two goddesses, uh, Nekbet and Wujet, on the crown. 
of the Pharaoh's headdress, uh, the headdress being a nemesis in this particular case. And uh, the, uh, and, and then right here on the left hand, the far left, you pretty much have the same thing. Instead of having the unk, being draped like we have in the other picture from, from the arm, from the, from the neck of the cobra, we find the shen, which is similar to the cartoons, but it's the, it's the shen. And you have the two goddesses, uh, Nekbet and uh, Wujet. In this particular scene, you 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 have the uh, goddess uh, uh, Menhet, and she's give, offering the uh, key of life, or the breath of life, to the pharaoh by taking the ankh and putting it towards his nose and his nostrils and his mouth. with uh, Jehudi and Hetheru in attendance and with uh, also Heru in attendance. Okay, this is, uh, when you come back down the steps, when you come back down the steps from the, uh, the Devil Temple, of course you're gonna run into the people who, uh, who are still around the temples today it, from the community, the Nubians selling their wares. Uh, this, this is a group from Howard University this past summer who came with some students and uh, and they're at the airport now it's another group, and it's interesting to see, and it's a good thing to see our young, uh, well, I wouldn't call them children, I mean, but they're, they're in college, but they're learning something about their culture and their history. Here, this is in the, uh, the Valley of the Kings. I, I can recognize the areas from just uh, being there. Uh, here, you got Luxor Temple out front. Of Luxor Temple in the evening. Then you got, uh, then you got, you have the Temple of Karnak and the Temple of Heshepsut. Mm -hmm. I figured I'd do a little picture photo album of them. This is in the Nubia Museum, top uh, left hand corner. The temple of uh, Nefertari, dedicated to the goddess Het Heru or Hathor. Uh, in front of the temple of Ramses II, it took a group photo. And this temple is dedicated to, uh, Re it, Ramses II built it, but it's dedicated to Rahurakti. And this is at uh, Ed Fu Temple. That's the setting sun. Uh, the temple at Coombo. This is in the evening. And the, the light that they use in the evening to uh, illuminate the temple really gives it a sort of magical uh, uh, it, it, it's, it, it's like a very magical uh, image to see the temple itself being lit in this way so this is the front of the temple main entrance and as you can see by the size of the people that's inside uh, you know that this temple is really as lar larger than what we, you know, uh, when you're looking at the pictures, you don't really get a sense of the scale. 
and this would be uh, the side of the temple looking towards the Nile River with the illumination. All right, so uh, that's the end. Medinet Habu Temple is going to be next, part seven, and then part eight. I'm working on that, so we're, we're uh, at the end right now. Now, uh, first I, I, I'll get something off that's been uh, on my mind off a while. Uh, there's a, a book out that says that the hieroglyphs have never been interpreted, and that much of what we know about Egypt has been the interpretations of Europeans. Uh, but the feeling is that because the hieroglyphs have never been deciphered, because you would have to know what those symbols actually meant from the people who created those symbols. So I, first, I wanted to know what is your interpretation? Of well, my thought, of well, 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 my thoughts on that is, uh, yes, a great majority of the hieroglyphs haven't been uh, interpreted. Uh, but because we are able to make comparisons with the hieroglyphs in various places, from the monuments to the papyrus, to uh, the, uh, uh, especially with the cartouches, when the name of the pharaoh appears in the cartouche, and the names of the pharaoh, the, 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 uh, the, the, the five different names that the pharaoh might have, you can recognize that name in one temple and then recognize the name in another temple. So that gives you the heads up on who this pharaoh was, what contributions he made, well, or a person of importance. Well, because they dedicate the temples, remember? Yeah. They dedicate the temples. They, they you know, uh, so you know what, uh, say for instance, uh, Thutmose III, we just got through talking about Thutmose III at Coombo, mm -hmm. being one of the initial uh, architects of the temple. But also you have the temples down in, in uh, Elephantine. Thutmose the third and Hatshepsut, both built a temple to the goddess uh, Setet, mm -hmm. the gazelle goddess, um, her symbol being the gazelle. So, uh, and then of course, you know, you have the, the temple of Thutmose uh, uh, the third himself, just that like you have a separate temple for the, 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 the goddess Hatshepsut, or the, uh, the, you know, these temples being dedicated. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So those cartouches, they don't change. And there's certain, there's, in other words, also the, from the book of Amtuat, the, the, the uh, book of, the so-called book of the dead, or the book of coming forth, mm -hmm. there is language in hieroglyph that you could see there as well as in the pyramid text, uh, you know, in the coffin text. So you, you have language that's identifiable. Mm -hmm. Now, whether it's uh, totally, uh, how should I say, uh, it totally interpreted the way it was supposed to be interpreted, that's another question. I, I couldn't answer that. But I know that this is the way that they make the comparisons with the language. Mm -hmm. uh, I showed early on where the language uh, of the uh, Ethiopians was totally different. The Gies, mm -hmm. you know. But they had, there were symbols, though, in Gies that you could see and say, oh, yeah, well, they're talking about a particular district here, mm -hmm. you know. And anytime you're talking about a particular dif uh, a district, you got that symbol that represents the, 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 the area. Mm -hmm. It's a symbol that says, well, this is the district of, uh, of uh, uh, Edfu. This is the district of Abydos. 
This is the district of. So, I mean, you, you're able to cross reference that with various papyrus mm -hmm. that talks about, let's say, the god of Cyrus being buried in uh, Abydos or Abu. Mm -hmm. uh, and so you, you, you have that. But then I don't believe that anybody, I don't believe that anybody, no Egyptologist today, knows the hieroglyphic totally and completely. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I will give you that. I mean, that's my thoughts on it. Mm -hmm. But we've gotten close enough to, to be able to identify, uh, let's say, the, the, the major aspects of hieroglyphs, the hieroglyphs. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I took a course with uh, Sister Raketi Wimley Mm -hmm. when she was living in, in New York before she got married uh, in 19, well, it must have been about 80, 86, 85, 86. I took a course with her. And uh, it, it was difficult because, you know, you're dealing with grammar, and, which is not my long suit. But I was trying to follow it as much as I possibly can. And having an artist background, I had no problem with drawing the images and whatnot that we had to, mm -hmm. we had to draw. And then find out that some of these images not only represented one word, but they represented two words. And then you had your triliterals, which represented three letters from one image. And, uh, you know, so it's, 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 that's a whole field within itself that, you know, you can spend a lifetime on. Take a young person, maybe uh, say 18 years old, and they'd, they'd probably be 70 something years old by the time they, they done completed that whole cycle of learning when it comes to the hieroglyphs. Okay. Uh, interesting. Uh, you know, because that's why I, I want to make my main focus the, the art and the architecture, because I, I think it tells just a bigger story as the brothers who come from the frame of reference as using religion, you know, to show the origin of religion. Because mm -hmm. you got brothers out there who will show the origin of religion and how it came out of the Nile Valley, so forth, so forth and so on. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's their main focus. People like uh, Ashwa Kwesi. Right. Uh, you know, uh, 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 who else? Uh, uh, this, this, this oh Charles Finch, this a lot of people. Oh Charles, Finch. yeah Charles Finch. He does a great job. Right? And this uh, the other brother too, who uh, the, who was a minister. Um, Hayden. But he's. He, he, he came from out of the church. Yeah, he's just. Getting uh, uh, Higgins. Higgins, he's just getting into that. Yeah, I know. I know he's just getting into it. But Higgins, but so, because Higgins, he he was really actually a student of Ashwa Kwesi. Yes, correct. And uh, so he, you know, and being that he got that background, it's, it would only be natural mm -hmm. that he could relate to specific incidents uh, in the, the, in the, in the uh, evolution of Christianity out of Egypt. Now, I want to ask you, what do you think would be the impact on the consciousness and therefore, the physical and actual actions of African people, if they really knew that they were descendants of Pharaonic ancient Egypt, mm. that they were the Egyptians. Well, see, uh, that's, that's the whole thing. I mean, if <laughs> we would have any problems today in terms of understanding who we are where we came from, and what we're doing here. With our rich history, and the rich contribution that we've made to world civilization, mm -hmm. if they was conscious of that and aware of that, you wouldn't have the kind of uh, miseducation you have today. But it's not entirely our fault, because we live in a culture where they don't want to promote the true historical aspects of the African in the diaspora. Mm -hmm. So we have to deal with Western academia or the, the Western heroes and herons. Uh, we have to deal with them to say, well, 
this is the standard. This is the epitome of what you should be trying to do. You should try to become another Abraham Lincoln, like I'm afraid my friend uh, Barack Obama and some of the other misguided uh, leaders uh, who lean towards the European paradigm for what is successful, for, for, for what is the uh, most important. Uh, this delusion, this, this delusion is, there's a, the majority of our people suffer from this delusion. Some, people, some of our people, they get arrogant if you try to tell them that, look, you had, a, you, you had a, all of civilization at your feet at one time, your ancestors. They don't want to, I don't want to listen to that. I don't want to hear that African stuff, you know, because mm -hmm. it's so unconscious running after illusions that the Europeans put out there that distort the reality of things that should be taught in school to our children mm -hmm. and it's not being taught. Mm -hmm. It's being hidden. Mm -hmm. And anybody who tries to teach it outright is going to be uh, is going to be uh, not, well, you're going to be persecuted, that's, that's for sure, because they don't want it. They don't want you to teach it. Now, you, you, you would think that more African Americans would be asking the question, well, why can't my children get the education that they, you know, they're supposed to have of their culture? Mm -hmm. You know? I mean, they celebrate everybody else's holiday in, in Western uh, civilization. Uh, you know, they celebrate you know, Christopher Columbus, they celebrate, uh, you know, who shot John and so forth and so on. But when it comes to the African experience, nobody really wants to do that when it, when it comes to European power. They want to stay in power. If our kids got the lessons that they were supposed to get in elementary school up to junior high school, they, you couldn't control them. You couldn't control them. You couldn't control them. You couldn't tell them. The, you couldn't tell them that they that, that they. Uh, in other words, you couldn't tell them that they were inferior. You couldn't make them feel inferior. But in order to reassure that they do feel inferior, you have to teach them about recent history, which is slavery in America and the emancipation from slavery and those people who were involved in emancipating the slaves, such as uh, Abraham Lincoln, which is a big lie, and all of the other so-called whites who were helping uh, the uh, African people in the diaspora. All of this is, you know, I mean, and they didn't only teach us that, but they, they even taught their own folks, the white folks that. You got white folks that's walking around that's, that's totally blind to uh, ancient uh, uh, African civilization. Mm -hmm. They don't know. They don't know. Mm -hmm. And on top of that, they don't want to know. Mm -hmm. A lot of they don't want to know because, look, they feel they with the class, the upper class, who has control over everything, economics, politics, and everything else. Why should they want to be, uh, uh, why should they want to accept your promotion of your own history and legacy. It's, it, you know, I mean, it becomes really complicated because, I mean, their history is all tied up in ours. Mm -hmm. Let me get back to those temples and, and ask you a few questions on trying to restructure a society and how the temples related to everything that was happening in the society, how it um, reinforced the value system and the way of life, um, and how the gods or the deities uh, manifested within the culture of that society so that it empowered people. The dynamics between gods and people. Uh, well, you know that the, the, the temples never stood isolated. Uh, there was always that interaction between temples, 
you know, you got you had the the Opet festival, which was a temple, uh, which was uh, Karnak uh, temple, and the marriage, if you will, between Karnak and Luxor temple, because the festivals would take place from Karnak to Luxor temple in the Opet festival. Uh, we spoke earlier about the temple of Dendera, the temple of Hathor, who would make the trip over 100 miles to the temple of uh, Edfu, uh, her consort, uh, Heru, uh, even bringing her child along with her, uh, Ihi, which is uh, another form of the god uh, uh, Konsu, uh, you know, that triad from Karnak, Amin-Ra, Mut, Kansu, the triad at Edfu, which was Hetheru, Heru, and Ihi. And even though they have different names and Greek names and so forth and so on, it was the principle. It was the principles in the temple that, that, that was significant. Now, if you weren't aware of the, if you can't see uh, Egypt through those symbolist eyes, then you, have, you will have a problem trying to figure out the connection and the interconnection between the temples. So that the communities themselves had, was, was aware of what the, uh, the, the atmosphere of uh, the, 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 the I, I hate to say religion because it wasn't really a religion, it was a way of life. Religion didn't come uh, until the Europeans came here, but they had communications with one another, and they knew what was important. That's why the calendar never changed in terms of how you see the calendar and how I see the calendar. You know, there was a calendar overall that everybody looked to because it was the standard. We're talking about the calendar, the uh, the calendar of the great year, twenty five thousand years. Uh, the one that you would find on the ceiling in the Temple of Dendera. Mm -hmm. uh, so everybody was aware of this now. I don't care what part of the country you came from, you still have to look at that as being one of the prime symbols because basically the whole Nile Valley was agricultural. Mm -hmm. So there were images already there that people couldn't accept. The, uh, the, the, uh, the nourisher, uh, Hed Heru, Hathor, the cow, the cow goddess. The cow was used by all villages for the milk and for other things that they needed from uh, the, the, the cow. That's why we got images showing the, the pharaoh as a baby sucking the milk right from under uh, Hed Heru's, from her, from, from her, uh, from her, from, yeah, it is. So there's a lot of things that connect. Uh, you know, I mean, so it they connect simply because when we look at some of the older gods from the south, and when I say the south, I'm talking about the southern part of the Nile River down to the first waterfall, Elephantine Island. Um, those gods down there. You, you got uh, Arrest Anufis. You have uh, Mandalis or Mandalusi. You have Kanun. You have all these gods that have the same personality in the north, up in Egypt. Under different names. Yeah. Arensa Nufus was Shu, the god Shu. Mm -hmm. uh, you had uh, uh, Mendelus, which is another form of Osiris. Mm -hmm. You had Kanun, the creator god from the south, who actually became Ptah in the north, who created, who was a creator god as well. You had Heheru from the south who later came into the form of Newt in the north. So although there were different locations and different temples, they all recognized the transmutation. 
uh, uh, Ra, the god Ra, defeated Amun in the first dynasty. Uh, but out of respect for Amun, the both deities were uh, combined into one, Amun Ra. Now, when this happened, the old god of Thebes, or what we call Waset, Karnak, that area, the main deity was Mantu, another war, war god, before there was an Amun Ra there. All right, so we're going back past the, the middle uh, 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 kingdom. We're going back towards the old and middle kingdom uh, so when the god Montu was the primary god there at Karnak. So what you have now, since then, Amin-Ra moved in and became the primary god of uh, that area of Waset. So although gods change and some of them lose certain characteristics those characteristics sometimes are absorbed into the primary gods. What I'm trying to ask, ask you is defining the principles mm -hmm. that these gods stood for or did they stand for principles and how these principles then affected the life of the people, how they interrelated to the gods, the principles of the gods and became... Um, Interactive. Well, you know, the gods are referred to as netters. Okay. Where we get the word nature from. Mm -hmm. The netters are, as I pointed out before, these are elements in nature. Mm -hmm. Now, it's only natural that certain things are going to happen and they're predictable. Uh, so that they could be prophesized, if you want to use it in that way. They know that the sun was going to come up every day. Mm -hmm. Now, in terms of human affairs, if you know tomorrow is going to be coming, there's certain preparations that you need to make in order to continue to live in the uh, in, 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 in the world that's created around you, in the world that you create. And one of the ways they did that was through the laws of complementary opposites. This is how it affects humans, the, the, the deities or the, the uh, netters. Uh, you have the planting season. Everybody gets out the implant. You got the, 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 the inundation of the Nile. Will everybody get the land ready for the rich silt, black silt that would be coming down with the uh, water? Uh, being conscious of that, you're going you're gonna to make some notation, whether it's on papyrus or on stone. So there's no separation of the gods and, and, and the people because you, you, all, you, you have to remember that one reflects the other. So to try to dissect it and, 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 and uh, into little itty bitty uh, uh, parts, you probably can do it. But if you just take the basic concept that it's all interrelated, it's interrelated. And we saw on the individual level where the Pharaoh himself is making praises to him own, his own self. Now, and he's worshiping himself. So if that's not a sense of pride in something, the people support the Pharaoh. That's why he's able to do this. Because of his education. And they know that he is a true leader. Not one of greed, because one of his uh, 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 painted uh, uh, saints is Ma'at. He got to go with Ma'at. Because the balance of that river overflowing and not overflowing is, this, is a balance that's already embedded in, in the consciousness of the people. Just like uh, 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 Ma'at. They know it's true. It's going to be 
Today is going to be like tomorrow because the sun will rise again. Uh, that's a, that's a, about the, the closest I can get to explaining the meaning of the deities to the people. Because the people and the deities, they're really one in the same if you look at it on a very abstract level. They're one in the same. Mm -hmm. So the temples were really a form of university training? Oh yeah, definitely. It was definitely uh, schools of uh, higher education. Uh, it would be the focal point of the community, uh, not only for education, but also for the, uh, the practice of, uh, of uh, being able to make contributions to the community through the temple. Yes, the big festivals and, and feasts, uh, you know, was to, uh, to, to, to uh, promote the well-being of the community, for the community to rejoice in the gifts that were uh, brought from, from the Nile River. Mm -hmm. So that, that's, why, that's why we see so many offering scenes. Because it was the community that, 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 you know, that wanted to... There was a foreigner who came into Egypt in the uh, 5th century AD and said, well, why did y'all why did, why did make the, these things so monumental? The, the temples, the pyramids, why, why, did, why did it have to be so monumental? And it was the feeling that the people themselves had and the pride that they had about themselves that they could actually express their own, uh, it, it express themselves through these large monuments. It was an expression of their pride. It's just as large as the pride that they had. So uh, that answers that question, I think, for me, at least anyway. I don't know if you got a chance, but I, I asked you if in your thinking you could think of relationships that can reconnect African people today to their uh, ancient Egyptian ancestors through traits, through character, through folklore, through blood, through whatever? Well, I mean, you just answered your own question. I mean, because it's all of that, um, you know, and you got to take uh, your uh, personal interest in it once you get the bug, as I, I, I'd like to put it, uh, where you're going to start to study it, and you're going to study your history and your legacy, and, and, and you find that questions, a lot of questions come up, this is a good thing because you need to follow through on those questions. Well, what is this? What is that? And how does it relate to me? Uh, those kinds of questions will drive you forward in terms of trying to figure out what the history and the legacy is about and how it relates to our people. So it, it, it might be for some people in the beginning a little confused. I know it was confusing for me and there were certain things that I just couldn't get past. I, but the, the more I studied, the more I started to realize that, you know, there's a connection between various uh, elements in our history and legacy that gives me more of a holistic picture of where I come from. And so I benefited from that. And uh, I remember you asked me the question personally, uh, the, the last time we uh, went over the lectures, it, you know, well, how did it help you? And, and I told you I was on the dark side. And I told you I was with that criminal element mm -hmm. and didn't know how to get out of it because I figured it was better to go steal, do anything I can to make my own money rather than work for this white man who happens to be the person that got me in this position in the first place. Because when I was coming through school, there was no encouragement about my religion. Or, I mean, my, not my religion, but so much about my race, where you come from, or any of these things. The only thing I knew was what they taught me in, in the school there. And by the time I got through with uh, high school, I was totally disillusioned because there was nothing that they could point to and show me, say, well, look, this is what your people did. Uh, you know, that was great. So, of course, when I started to find out about it, 
started to read, started to do a little research. I'm saying, well, hmm, you mean to tell me that all this time, this information has been brushed aside and I was being fed this intellectual nonsense about the West and the great contributions that Western civilization made. And I couldn't see myself in any of those contributions. It's very easy for me to go and start then to start to research and do my research on, on, on uh, my history and my legacy. I was glad I did. Because otherwise I wouldn't have found out that I was the one that initiated what they call Western civilization right now. And I'm sure there's a lot of us, you know, who are conscious, uh, recognize that fact. But the ones who are still unconscious, like your college graduates and uh, graduates from the master's program and uh, graduates from the doctoral programs who are still in Greek fraternities, uh, that's about as far back as they can go. And of course, you know, they'll be the first advocates of Greek Western civilization as, uh, as the Greek is being the, the Greeks being the foundation of Western civilization and have no no knowledge that the Greeks came and studied at the feet of the great African teachers mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so that's uh, th that's why I think it's important that you know the children start to learn something about their history and their legacy um, my son is 21 years old, goes to Long Island University, he manages one of the radio shacks, and it wasn't up until just this year that I gave him the lecture, told him to go watch it, and then report back to me so that we could discuss it. I gave him the lecture uh, by Professor Walter Williams, the origin of uh, Christianity, I believe it was. Mm -hmm. And when he got through, I had to, I had to nudge him a couple of times because he said, oh yeah, dad, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna see it, you know, but I gotta do this. And, and I said, yeah, but I need you to see this now. I said, cause I want my tape back. And I told him, it's, 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 it's excellent. You really enjoy it. And when, one of the first, when he told me that he had seen it, he said he started it, and then there was another time he was going to pick back up and finish seeing the whole thing. So when he finished seeing the whole thing, I asked him, I said, now, I asked him a simple question. I said, the letter J. I said, when was that invented? He said, oh, the letter J. He said, well, that was in the 15th century. I said, mm-hmm. I said, you remember that, right? I said, now, you should have had a pad and pencil with you so you could write down some stuff. And I said, what about the creation of Jesus Christ? He said, oh, no, that was, that, that was Ptolemy, Ptolemy Lagay. I, I said, oh, okay, all right. He, he, he was the anointed one. And so I said, okay, all right. Uh, and uh, so it makes me feel good that my son is inculcating the real uh, deal out there in terms of his education and everything else. I remember he had to take a world history class a couple of years ago at, at school in uh, LIU. And they started out with the, of course, they're gonna start out with the uh, Babylonian cultures and civilizations being older. And then they came to Egypt. And I told him, I said, look, you know, I gave him a book, I, I think it was The Destruction of Civilizations uh, uh, by uh, Chancellor Williams. Mm -hmm. I told him, I said, look, you read this book, and after he, he started reading it while he was taking the course, and, and I told him, because he came back and he told me, he said, look, I had to confront the, the professor, and I said, look, you, got, you can't just, I said, they, look, these people, what they think that they're teaching you is what they learned. They didn't, they didn't learn that, that Egypt was older. 
and in the format of the curriculum is designed not to start from the earlier civilization, but the one that's closest to the earlier civilization. I said, that's why y'all went into Babylonia and Mesopotamia and all those places. And then you finally came to, to Kemet in Egypt. You know, I said, but the, the, the real deal is, I said, you got to look at Kemet and see how it influenced the other Asiatic cultures. And so, you know, it's a good thing. I could sit down and talk with him and, you know, give him a, a heads up so he don't have to be disappointed like I was when I was coming up his age about what his true history is. I mean, look, I, my oldest daughter, older than him, her name is Heshepsu. That's on the birth certificate. Mentu Hotep, that's my son, and my other uh, daughter, the uh, younger one, who's about 19 now, that's Nefertari. That's on their birth certificate. That's on their birth certificate. My grandson, his name is Pianchi, even though they want to try to keep calling him, you know, I mean, his father, uh, my, my, my uh, daughter's uh, uh, old man, he keeps, he said, his name is Germain, Germain. I said, well, what, I said well, what is Germain? I said, what is that, German? I mean, what does that, St. Germain? I, I said, he should have an African name. You know what, they, and my daughter, I thought she knew better. Because Heshep Suit used to get up there in the first world and used to read uh, Witcher Collins poems. The brother from South Carolina. Yes. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I was kind of, but she said, oh, no, well, you know, that's the name you want to give. And I said to her, I said, well, you know what, you should find out what the, uh, uh, who, who was Pianchi. And uh, even to this day, he's two years old. But if he was walking past that door there and I call him Pianchi, he'll come right in. Grandpa, Grandpa. That's right. And they all of them in the household where he's living call him Jermaine. So, uh, so the names, like I said before, I, we gave them those names at birth and we knew that they had to, to, to defend it. Mm -hmm. And one good thing as I was going through uh, my career working for the Board of Education and teaching, if I would be uh, transferred to another school or I wanted to go to another school, I'd make sure that my, my kids would come with me. So this way I got an eye on them all the time. And, then, you know, so they, they behave themselves very well while they had, were at school. Uh, you know, so I think that's one of the reasons why they were able to go on to college and, you know, work and, you know, do whatever they had to do. But they would have to defend that name, and I knew that from the early, from the earliest beginning. Because my son used to come home after being in fights, mm -hmm. uh, you know, because he said they would, people was trying to, you know, call his name, but they was using his name as a way of digging him. Mm -hmm. You know, what is that? Meta, 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 ta, ta. Uh, you know, how you pronounce your name? Where you get that that name from? You know, what does it mean? So he had to get with the program. He had to be able to defend it. I told him, I said, look, you have to look up who, you know, what it means and who, who it is. Now it got to the point where he accepts that name fully and completely. And, uh, and, and maybe sometimes a little shy of explaining it to other people what it means because, you know, they would put him automatically in a category of a, a person who's on a higher higher plane in terms of understanding, you know, why he's got a name like that and why they don't understand what that name is. So I think it benefited him. And uh, that's what we need to do. We need to focus on getting this information across to our children, which is very, very important. Uh, I, can't, I can't think of anything more important than that. Well, we, brother, 